scripture reading is from the second chapter of the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 2, and we're going to read in that chapter from the beginning. The book of Daniel is found at the end of the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Lamentations is in between Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and at the end of the book of Ezekiel you will find the book of Daniel and Last Sunday we began a series of studies in Daniel chapter 1 and we turn today to chapter 2. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled and he couldn't sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I have had a dream that troubles me and I want to know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king in Aramaic, and as a matter of fact, for the next six chapters, the book of Daniel is written in Aramaic, which was the common international language of the ancient Near East. The astrologers answered the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will interpret it. The king replied to the astrologers, This is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turned into piles of rubble. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. Once more they replied, Let the king tell his servants the dream and then we will interpret it. Then the king answered, I'm certain you are trying to gain time because you realize that this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me the dream, there is just one penalty for you. You have conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping the situation will change. So then tell me the dream and I will know that you can interpret it for me. The astrologers answered the king, there is not a man on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among men. This made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death, and men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. He asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went in to the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever, Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He sets up kings and deposes them. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. Daniel then goes in to Nebuchadnezzar and explains the dream to him from verse 29. As you were lying there, O king, your mind turned to things to come, and the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. As for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because I have greater wisdom than other living men, but so that you, O king, may know the interpretation and that you may understand what went through your mind. 
You looked, O king, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were broken to pieces at the same time and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream, and now we will interpret it to the king. You, O king, are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them. You are that head of gold. And then he goes on to describe the kingdoms that follow possibly the great kingdoms of the Medo-Persians and the kingdom of Alexander the Great, the great Greek kingdom, and then perhaps the Roman kingdom. And in verse 44, in the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and the interpretation is trustworthy. Then Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all its wise men. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon, while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. One of the most important lessons a Christian, whether young or old, can ever learn is this. That when God enables us to go through times of difficulty and pressure with spiritual success, those times of difficulty and pressure are ordinarily in God's purposes, preparations to enable us to withstand greater and more severe pressure. And that runs very contrary to all our natural desires for our lives, even as Christians instructed in God's Word, when we are brought through a time of difficulty and pressure, we invariably find ourselves relaxing, beginning to smile, and saying at least silently, thank God that's over. I wouldn't like to go through that again. And yet, as I say, constantly in the purposes of God, as He gives us such enabling grace, His purpose is not then to allow us to relax and never face difficulties and trials again. His purpose has been to build into us such spiritual strength and wisdom from our experience that we will be able to cope with even greater pressures and still stand firm. You cannot read the story of the life and ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ without noticing that that is true, that the tests, that the temptations he experienced at the beginning of his ministry 
prepared him to withstand even greater tests as his ministry continued. And that was certainly true for Daniel and his three companions. In chapter 1, what was at stake, what was being tested, was their spiritual and moral integrity. And that was what was at stake, their integrity as God's children and God's servants. But what now is at stake in Daniel chapter 2 is not simply a matter of their personal integrity. It is actually a matter of their lives. And as their life, not simply their livelihood, but their very life is at stake. The question that arises in this great story is how are they going to be able to stand faithful to their Lord when their very life is at stake. Will he come and deliver them? And as the story unfolds in its wonderful narrative here in chapter 2, it is rather obvious that the camera through which we are invited to look at this story is focusing attention on three different characters in the drama. The first, of course, is God himself. It shows us what God himself is doing. The second is Nebuchadnezzar. The narrative tells us how Nebuchadnezzar responds to what God is doing. And the third is Daniel and his companions. And the way in which this story displays for us, illustrates for us, the kind of men, the kind of believers who are able to see through such times of stress in a way that brings glory to God. And I want us to look at each of these characters in this drama to see what it is this second chapter of the book of Daniel is intended to teach us. What is God doing? Well, God is obviously displaying, by way of this dream revelation, He is displaying his ultimate purposes through Nebuchadnezzar to Daniel and his companions. Nebuchadnezzar has this famous dream, this great statue, that he's obviously been thinking about, as the chapter tells us. He has had various thoughts in his mind as he's been lying on his bed, and then he falls asleep, and this strange vision comes to him of this multi-structured, gigantic, image that is being built, the kind of thing that he actually himself does, you remember, in the next chapter. He builds a gigantic image of himself. Now, if we are to understand what that dream was really about, we need to understand that it was commonplace in the ancient Near East when a king or dictator like Nebuchadnezzar gained victory over a part of the world he would establish a statue of himself as a kind of physical representation of his authority, of his sovereignty, of his ownership of that land. And that's obviously what Nebuchadnezzar is dreaming about and actually effects in the next chapter. He wants to show, as sometimes we see in the modern world, in these gigantic statues that people build of themselves or of others, he wants to show his sovereignty and his power and his lordship and his majesty. And what God wants to show him is fading as the worldling's pleasure and treasure, all his vaunted boasts, all his display of majesty and power. There is only one who sets up kings and puts them down, who sets up kingdoms and puts them down. And as this dream is given to Nebuchadnezzar, leaving him, whether he was able to remember it or not, is not totally clear, but leaving him with a profoundly uneasy feeling that he does not have total sovereign control over the affairs of the universe. He is left with this memory of the vision of the kingdom that God will build that is sovereign, that is invincible, and that ultimately will be universal. 
And in this, God is displaying curiously to us through the mind and dreams of this pagan man, God is displaying his committed purpose to build a kingdom in this world that no other kingdom will be able to withstand and that one day will fill the whole earth. And it is very important for us, as it was, as we shall see in a moment for Daniel, to understand that that is God's central purpose in a fallen world to reclaim that world for himself and to build in that world a kingdom that will outlast all earthly kingdoms and to enthrone a king who will reign over all earthly kings. And we are given a little glimpse of that, aren't we, later on in this passage in verse 46, when Nebuchadnezzar comes and prostrates himself before God's representative. What's it a picture of? It's a kind of miniature picture of what God intends to do ultimately universally through the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. When every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's what God intends to do. And that, of course, throughout the ages has been a great succor and strength to Christian people, especially afflicted and persecuted Christian people. That whatever man may do, man cannot halt the advance of the kingdom of God. As Isaac Watts has taught us to sing, Reading the 72nd Psalm, Jesus shall reign where'er the sun does his successive journeys run. And as we noted last Sunday morning, when we are going through a day when the church is experiencing a kind of Babylonian captivity in the United Kingdom, although thankfully not elsewhere. We need to lift up our eyes and see that God is doing this very thing in many other parts of the world. And that there is no part of the world in which God will not ultimately triumph. So that is what Daniel chapter 2 is to tell us about what God is doing. And you and I need to lift up our eyes to that promise and believe it and hold on to it that there is nothing and no one who can ultimately halt the advance of the kingdom of our Savior Jesus Christ. We have received, says the author of Hebrews, we have received a kingdom which cannot be shaken. Well, all other kingdoms in this world, including our own kingdom incidentally, can easily be shaken. But then are we told about Nebuchadnezzar? Well, Nebuchadnezzar's response to this dream vision is interesting and significant. And it comes in two parts to us in the narrative. There is a private response. And his private response is to be troubled in spirit and to find that sleep has gone from him. And the reason for that, apparently, is that his dreams have gone wrong. Whether or not he can remember the details is not clear, but he can remember the impression of this dream, and the impression of this dream is that all his worldly dreams have gone wrong, and he has dreamt something that threatens his personal power base and discovered something that he cannot understand a rock cut out of the hill by no human hand that destroys this image that has been built. Here is something he cannot understand, and even more significantly, obviously, here is something there is no way he can control. This man, who now in the second year of his reign is growing accustomed to being able to control everything that he puts his hand on, and in the middle of the night, he is given this nightmare that reminds him 
that He is not ultimately sovereign, and there are some things He cannot control. But then it's His public reaction that is so telling and so significant. It's His public reaction that really gives us insight into what is really going on privately in Nebuchadnezzar's life and heart, because his public reaction is violent in the extreme. His public reaction is to exhaust all the powers that have been given to him in a hope that he will be able to withstand the force of this new kingdom and defend his own territory. And so he not only threatens his own court counsel with death, he is in the process of activating that death threat when Daniel enters the scene and brings it to a halt. And the really interesting thing about his reaction is this, and it's so important that you see it and begin to apply it to situations that you meet with in your own life. The really significant thing about his reaction is this. It is out of all proportion. It is out of all proportion to the experience that he has had. All he has had at the end of the day is a bad dream that unsettles him and threatens his total sovereignty. And in his desire to defend his total sovereignty, he is in grave danger of annihilating those who are around him who in the past have been his source of help and strength and perhaps even encouragement, these pagan wise men and sorcerers and magicians. What does it reveal to us? My friends, it reveals this. Here is a man who has already sought to destroy the kingdom of God and found four teenagers prepared to withstand him. And he's now beginning to reveal the insecurity of the guilty conscience and the wicked heart. And whenever that insecurity of a guilty conscience and a wicked heart, of someone who stands against the advance of God's kingdom, whenever that is revealed, that individual is liable to lash out in ways out of all proportion to whatever experiences have begun to disturb them. And you see that in your life, don't you? It may simply be your testimony, where you live, where you work, perhaps even in your home. And it seems as though all hell is let loose against you. Why is that? Well, you need to begin to understand what Daniel and his companions obviously began to understand, that the sheer irrationality of that kind of response is an indication there is something far deeper going on in that man's conscience, in that woman's conscience, than appears on the surface. And moreover, that that anger, that anger and hostility against these counselors and wise men is not in the last analysis an anger and hostility against them, but actually an expression of a deep-seated anger and hostility against God that has been revealed by these circumstances. And that's the third thing that I want you to notice. We notice what God was doing. We notice how Nebuchadnezzar was responding. And the third thing we notice is how Daniel was proving his faithfulness. How do you deal with a situation like this? Well, Daniel shows us how to begin to deal with it. When Arioch, verse 14, the commander of the king's guard had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. And that signals for us that what we now see in the way in which Daniel responds is an illustration of how the child of God will wisely respond to this kind of opposition to his or her testimony to Jesus Christ. And you'll notice he does four things which serve as models of how you and I respond 
when we find ourselves under similar pressure, facing similar opposition to our testimony to the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Well, first of all, he did this. Mark it. He gave himself space. He refused to be cornered into giving an instantaneous response. He gave himself space in order that he might have space to think about the situation in a clear-headed way that was informed by what he knew God had taught him in the Scriptures. Always, if you possibly can, under these situations, avoid the instantaneous knee-jerk response. Respond only in ways that you have been able to think through biblically. And so, first of all, Daniel seeks to give himself space in verse 16. He asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. Second, he shared his situation and his need with trusted friends. Verse 17, Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He shared the burden of the situation with those he could count on to help him to discern a wise way to respond under the direction of God's Word. Thirdly, he waited upon God and pled with God in prayer. Verse 18, he urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Why is he concerned about this? What they are really praying about is the maintaining of the kingdom of God in Babylon. They are virtually God's only representatives in Babylon. As far as they know, the kingdom of God depends upon them. And therefore they are praying, O Lord, if it is true that your kingdom depends upon us, save us that we may serve you. And then fourthly, he has this great confidence that God will defend his kingdom. And that since God has brought him to Babylon in his sovereign providence and promised to keep him in Babylon and use him in Babylon, then he is sure that God will defend him in Babylon. Whereas kingdoms may rise and kingdoms may fall, his testimony to God's word will last and endure. I wonder if you're here in church and you're in precisely the same kind of situation at work, perhaps even at home, among your neighbors that Daniel was in. God has put you where you are for a special purpose. He means to build his kingdom through you. My friend, it should not surprise you then that all hell will be let loose against you. How are you going to be able to stand? Well, you must know two things. You must first of all understand that when hostility against you is out of all proportion to anything you understand that you may be or may have done, you need to understand that that hostility is not against you primarily, but against him primarily. And it is knowing that that enables you not to take that hostility personally, but to take it as hostility that comes to you because you belong to Jesus Christ who has prepared you. If I suffered, you will suffer. If they rejected me, they will reject those who are identified with me, not for their own sakes, but because they belong to me. You may even take that as an encouragement that your life is shining for Jesus Christ, that there is an enemy who will oppose and seek to blot out that shining. And then we learn to do what Daniel learned to do, to give ourselves space to think, to find ourselves friends with whom to share, to wait upon God to seek his mercy, and to have every confidence 
that he will defend the kingdom he has promised to build for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it may be that you will experience something like what Daniel himself experienced in verse 46. That those who have so hostilely opposed you will fall prostrate before you and ask for your help. Dare to be a Daniel. Dare to stand alone. Dare to have a purpose firm. And dare to make it known. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, some of us undoubtedly experience these very pressures in the days in which we live. And we pray you would give us both courage and grace, wisdom and insight, that we may stand firm for Jesus Christ and live to see a day when your kingdom is extended even into the lives of those who have opposed it. This we pray for ourselves. This we pray for our city. This we pray for our nation. In Jesus' name, amen.